That got your attention, didn't it? Wait and see, all right? Hey, my name's Brian. Good morning. How are you? So you're like, when do we start clapping? I don't know. All right, that's fine. Hey, I, if you're new here, I'm glad that you're here. And we asked, man, after service, would you head out to the spot in our lobby? Big orange sign, X marks the spot. There's some folks there. They'll get to, get to know you a little bit better and tell you about how we love to live the adventure here in Christ. And that happens as we experience God, build community, and impact lives. And uh, for those of you online, make sure to text LIVE to the number on the screen. And, and then uh, to those that are listening with the, the Spanish translator right now, hola. Um, I'm glad that you're here. Like, I don't know if you knew we had that, but right now in this service, there is a Spanish translator that is in real time uh, speaking Spanish, because I don't, and, uh, and we got folks that are listening in in this space and worshiping with us, so I think that's kind of cool. Hey, let me cover something real quick, just a little bit of housekeeping thing for us, and, and one of the things that we've noticed as a church is that we're getting progressively younger. This is to be celebrated because we have lots of young families coming and you all are getting married and, and making babies. And uh, I'm glad you figured out how that works. That's good to be celebrate, celebrate that. But here, here's the thing. In this space, this hour a week is where we're entering into God's presence as the community. And, and so let me talk to the parents real quick. Some of you like to bring your kids in here. That is great. But here's what we're asking. If, if your little one's got the wiggles and, and can't stay in their seat, um, we would just ask that you would go to the lobby with them or even get them in kids' ministry. And then if you have a little one that, that you want to rock to sleep and you want to bounce and you're going to be standing up somewhere bouncing, first of all, it's weird that they're 18. Um, and, and so like, you have clearly incredible core strength. Um, but, but if that's happening too, we just ask that you would go to the lobby or, or out to the cry room and you go, we have a cry room or your message is that bad? No, no, it's for babies that are crying. And, and here's why. And, and this is really important. There's two reasons. Number one, we don't want kids running around up on the mezzanine, especially on the stairs, which has been happening, because if they fall and get hurt, that's going to be a bummer. The second reason is this thing called focus. When, when we're here and, and, and you're having to maybe wrangle in your kid, it's hard for you to focus. But then also, uh, you'll notice that other people are, are seeing that, and it's hard for them to focus. We've had a couple of folks kind of commenting on that. And, and so we want to say we, we love our families. We want you here. But if, if your little one is just rambunctious like I was as a kid, and just, man, out in the lobby with them, or kids been, and, and we'll celebrate that. So, Now... That being said, uh, Mish talked about this thing called TAG, and, and uh, this, this stems from one of our, our staff, Brad, uh, our global outreach pastor, came to me and said, Brian, I got this idea for the church. And I said, well, what's the idea, Brad? Um, and, and he said, We're gonna, what if we played TAG? And I said, that's not really a new idea. That's an old thing. I don't know where you grew up, but, but we could do that. And, and he started pitching the idea and talking to me, and, and I thought, this sounds like a great idea. So we're going to play tag as a church, if you want to, through the month of June out in our community, right? And so we're going to have these bracelets, and we got orange bracelets, and we got black bracelets. And, and the whole purpose of tag is just to develop and, and have fun together. And, uh, and so let me give you a couple of rules with, with tag. Uh, the first rule, if you're going to play, is that church is safe. Now, that should be a no-brainer anyways, but in the game of tag, especially, if you remember, you had that home base when you played when you were little. It's like, you know, the, the, the patio furniture is safe, the, the tree is safe, the neighbor's dog, not safe, stay away from him. And, and so if you were at, or holding on to safe, you couldn't get out. Well, with tag, we're going to say church is safe because we just plain old, we need a safe place. And, and then um, when we're playing tag, there's two color wristbands. If you have a black wristband, you are it. Right? So guess who chose a black wristband? Um, and so the idea then is that you're going to see people in the community with an orange wristband, and you get to go up to them and go, tag, you're it, give me your wristband, and you switch wristbands. But, but it's more than that, uh, because within tag, we got some more rules here. Uh, there are no tag backs. All right? So if you're in Costco, and, and you're foraging, like on a Sunday afternoon after church, which is glorious... And someone comes up to you, and they got a black band, and you got an orange band, and you swap in aisle four. They can't, you can't go find them in aisle eight and say, uh, you're it now. There's no tag backs in that moment. Now, if you go to Home Depot and you run into them in the next 10 minutes, game on. But, but here's what we don't, please don't do this. Like, don't chase each other. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't need that liability. Like, not all publicity is good publicity, Okay. But it's, it's just for us to walk up and say, hey, I, I see your wristband, you go to Summit. And, and so this is what we're asking too, would you have a conversation? And, and so it's more than just tag your it. This is for us to say hi in the community because 
Uh, I've met people, I felt so bad. I hate when I meet people that have been here forever and I don't know them. And so this morning I met a couple, uh, they've been here for two years, and I'm like, and I'm just meeting you. They go, well, we see you every weekend. I said, that's not fair. Um, and, and so the idea is to have a conversation and talk with them and say, hey, what's going on? How long have you been at Summit? Are you in a community group? You serve, what's going on? And, and uh, maybe even how can I pray for you? And then the, the final rule in TAG is no crying, all right? Seriously, no crying. That just needs to be stated. I don't want you coming, I got tagged out. It's not like that. It's not elimination. And, and it's just a way for us to have fun. So I know tomorrow I'm going to get picked on at the gym. Joke's on them. I'm not going, all right? <laughs> Clearly. Um, but when you see people do that, so here we go. Now, you go, are these all that we have due to budget cutbacks? Yes. <laughs> we got, we're going to get some of these. We got so many of them. So we'll just see how that goes. Um, here, you're it. <laughs> Sorry about your eyeball. So we got, at the end of the service, this is really fun. I, the can, okay, hold on. You get, <clears throat> how'd we do? Oh, don't fall out of your seat. And then you got baptized. Oh, hold on. Didn't you, you got, I, you got baptized. So here, you can, I'm off camera. That's driving them nuts right now. <laughs> and I'm back and seen. Okay. <laughs> By the way, uh, I'm going to go over, but I don't care. Um, if you haven't seen our pickleball courts, get out there and play. I got to play pickleball in between services. Greatest Sunday ever. And you, you go, why, why did we put pickleball in? Because it's fun. And you know it's the fastest growing sport in America. If you ask anyone that plays pickleball, they'll tell you that. So I don't know if it's true. It could just be a lie we perpetuate. But we put that in to be a blessing to our community as well. When I got here at 6.30 this morning, I'm here, dink, dink, dink. And I go, what on earth is going on? And I go over there, and there are people that don't go to Summit on our property on a Sunday at 6.30 playing pickleball. That calls, that's a win. Yeah. So invite them, get them here, play pickleball. Do you have to reserve the court? No. If you beat me, do you have to feel bad? Maybe. Uh, it's, it's on you. But you don't have to reserve it. Just show up, invite people, invite people that don't go to church, tell them you'll buy them a latte uh, and, and come into the cafe. So here we go. Now, in, in my life, uh, I'm a bicentennial baby. This means that I was born in 1976. Um, I was a C-section. I was, I guess, I was told that. I, there, there's no evidence of that, but I'm here. And, and uh, my, my parents had a decision to make. Do they want me born in 76 or 77? And my dad said, tax deduction, 76 it is. And so I was born at the end of December. So I'm currently 47. I'm bald. Uh, my blood pressure and cholesterol aren't the best. Thank you, genetics, and you all. You're to blame. Um, no, not really. It's just it's really bad genetics, so I'm medicated. When I go to the gym, which I do about three days a week, I, I can't lift as much as I used to, and, and now my eyeballs are going, and I have to wear glasses, reading glasses, which is why I have a very large iPad up here, um, and, and so this is like the reality of my life. It's first, uh, uh, for, or second Corinthians, rather, four and five, it talks about our bodies as tents as well. This tent is breaking down. But with all that I've got going on that's negative about my, my body, I, I've got one thing that I can fall back on. It's my teeth. My teeth are great teeth. And when I go to the dentist, I go twice a year. Some of you are like, where are you going with this? Just hang with me. It'll get worse. Um, when I go to the dentist, I go twice a year because they tell me that's good for my teeth, good for my health, great for my marriage. So I go, and, and, and the, the dental hygienist always asks me, do you floss? Now, let's think through this. I sit in this, this lady's chair for an hour a at a time, twice a year. So I'm, I'm invested in, in two hours of time with this woman. Um, our, our relationship is purely transactional. I sit there with my mouth open. She's got her, her welding mask and tools and just this kind of thing. And, and my insurance pays for it. And so I'm not emotionally invested in this at all. Like, we're probably never, our families are never gonna go on vacation together. When I, when I see her in Winco, I probably wouldn't recognize her without the welding mask on. And, and, and at the end of the day, though, I, I'm a pastor I'm a Christian, and I'm supposed to be a man of integrity. So when she asks, do you floss, I look at her and say, nah, no, I don't. To which she responds, oh my gosh, you have great teeth. To which I respond, hello, taken, back it up, lady, all right? <laughs> so this is a reality in my life. That's the only thing I got going for me, right? So let me turn, let me turn this on us just a little bit and not talk about dental hygiene anymore. Yeah, you're like, oh, thank God. That was like three minutes too long. If I asked you about your prayer life, how would you respond? 
Like, how's your prayer life? Would you wanna lie? Would you wanna lie about how you pray and when you pray and the depth and, vi- depth and vibrancy of your prayer life, the things you pray about? And you just go, oh, me and Jesus, we're so close. So you often find that the discipleship, in our discipleship, our, our prayer life is, is somewhat anemic. And it's not supposed to be that way in the upside down kingdom of Jesus. Right, we're, we're in this series where we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached. Jesus preached in the first century up on the, the side of a hill by the Sea of Galilee. And he spoke such incredible truths. And we've been hanging in this, this text um, for a number of weeks. And we're going to finish up next week, to which I'm kind of bummed because I've really enjoyed it. But we're looking at the words of Jesus and saying, do we believe it and are we doing it? And so today we're looking at prayer. And Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Now my guess is, as I read this, as we talk about prayer, that there are some of us who we have a hard spot in our, in our hearts when it comes to prayer because you thought, you know what, Brian, I, I did pray and they still died. I did pray and the divorce still was finalized. I did pray, we still don't have a kid. I, we, I, I did pray and I'm still single. There's that, 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 that sin that keeps plaguing me, that addiction. I did pray and, and nothing happened. And there's some very real hurts in our lives that we hold on to that we prayed over and those places still remain and we kind of like, hey, what gives, Lord? And then for others of us, we're like, you know what? I love it. Like, amen, amen. I pray and that stuff happens and it's great. But here's what I know. Wherever you are, like on the spectrum, wherever you are with prayer, we can grow. Right? My hope today is that we'll have a deeper understanding of prayer. And it's not this mystical thing, but very practical. And we'll have some more arrows in our quiver that we can engage with when it comes to prayer. And so let me give us a working definition of prayer. It's simply prayer is communicating with God. Prayer is entering into the presence of God. And so prayer is us coming to our Heavenly Father, communicating with Him, listening to Him, acknowledging His presence in our lives, acknowledging His direction in our world, even at times receiving His discipline for the sin in our life. And when it comes to when we come to God in prayer, we're communicating, and this is incredible. We're communicating with the eternal, transcendent God who is also very present and interested in what's going on in our lives. He's very present with us. This means that we can pray. We can pray when we're driving, especially on Pyramid Highway. You with your eyes open? Yeah, that's the important. Thank you. Just, just a side note, if you're driving and praying, at least keep one eye open. All right, no depth perception, but you'll know what's going on. But we pray when we're driving, we can pray when we're alone or in a crowd or with a friend, when it's quiet, when it's noisy, when the sun is shining, and those glorious moments when snow is falling. You can communicate with God in moments of peace and moments of stress. And so every moment, every space becomes an opportunity to pray. But what, but, but what if I feel insufficient in, in my prayer life, in, in my words? Like, I just don't know the words to say or the knowledge. Like, I, like, how should I pray? Well, we go back to the Beatitudes at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, when you feel less than able or poor in spirit, you're in a great spot. Because all you can do is rely on God and show up and say, God, I, I really don't know how to do this well. I don't know what I'm measuring it against, but I, I feel insufficient. And, and the Lord says, good. I'll meet you in that space. And so we can breathe a little easier when, when it comes to prayer. Move from the mysterious to the practical. And I love how uh, authors Kyle uh, Strobel and, and John Coe uh, normalize prayer in their book, Where Prayer Becomes Real. They say prayer is not a place to be good. It's a place to be honest. Prayer is not a place to perform. It is a place to be present. Prayer is not a place to be right. It's a place to be known. Prayer is not a place to prove your worth. It is a place to receive worth and offer yourselves in truth. And so uh, prayer, it's a place of honesty. It's a place of being present, of being known, and then also receiving from God in those moments. It sounds like a powerful invitation to enter into the presence of God and communicate with him. 
And so Jesus tells us, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds and, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. In our communication with God, we are to ask, seek, and knock. We're to ask, seek, and knock. And notice the increasing intensity of these activities. It's not like, hey, just ask. And then if there's no answer, be like the UPS guy when he knocks on your door and you're hiding out and he just kind of walks away. For some of us, that's how we respond in prayer, though, isn't it? And Jesus says, no, ask. And so we keep asking with confidence and humility, and we seek, and we keep seeking with care and and application, and we knock, and we keep knocking with earnestness and perseverance. And again, we might say, Brian, I I tried that, and it didn't work. But but I wonder, and and I want to tread lightly on this, I, I wonder if many of our passionless prayers are not answered for good reason, because it's almost like we're asking God to care about something we really don't care about either. I don't think we can complain about anemic answers to anemic prayers. And I know in this moment, and in that kind of moment, if you stop believing that God can answer your prayer, that doesn't change God. That changes you and how or if you will even pray. And so I don't want to seem callous. I know there are some deep hurts and some deep longings in our soul that we pray for, and we still don't. We still don't know where God is. We don't know where he's working or if he's even hearing us. And and, and I I know that, but we're still called to ask and to seek and to knock. And Jesus says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you were evil, ouch, Jesus, but true, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now, this seems like a no-brainer to us today. We, We like to give good gifts. Even if we can't afford to give good gifts, We'll go and find something in the heart behind it communicates that it's a good gift. And Jesus says, come on, if you're trying to do that kind of stuff, how much more our Father in heaven who wants to give us good gifts, right? And so we're to ask and we're to seek and we're to knock. Now, what I want to do, though, is is I want to explore some foundations that we need to have in our life uh, for prayer and then some types of prayer and then how often should we pray, And so let's start with this first foundation, this foundational aspect when it comes to prayer, is we are to pray in submission to God. As we think about our prayer life and this invitation to ask and to seek and to knock, one of the core beliefs, the core theology for us is that we need to pray in submission to God. Our lives must be submitted to God. If they're not, he will hear us. But to be honest with you, God is more interested in your soul and in your heart than in your circumstances. And so he wants us to live in submission to us uh, or to him. And, and so they, he wants to make us whole and bring healing. And so in this, we're to submit to the sovereign will of God. Now, to be honest, this is tough for us. We see this in Genesis 3 when God said, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam and Eve are like, you mean this one? Because we don't want to submit to the will of God. It's not in our our broken, fallen nature to do so. And and so there are times, honestly, in my life when I'm like, God, I think your time frame isn't the best. And I think your decisions aren't the best. And I think I would make a horrible God. So I will do as best as I can to submit to what you're doing. But I wish you'd get on board with my calendar, my time schedule. (laughs) By the way, he has yet to do that thankfully, because I'm a horrible lowercase g God. But we're to submit, and I, I, I think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night of his arrest. He knew that the cross waited for him the next day. He knew the pain and the agony he would go through. And so he prays this, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Here's a guy that's looking at it's waiting him and saying, I really don't want to do that. I'd rather not but it's not up to me, Lord, your will be done. And he tells us uh, back earlier in in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, in the Lord's Prayer rather, your kingdom come, your will be done, right? And I know it's tough to submit to God's will when that thing that you're praying about is big and heavy and scary and it doesn't seem to be moving and it might even feel like God's asleep at the wheel, but he's not. And so we pray in submission to God and then another foundation is we pray knowing God is good. Like Jesus just got done telling us, hey, you're, you're the Father gives good gifts. Why? Because God is good, because he is love. As Pastor Chad Veach writes, if you pray according to the Bible, you'll pray from the unshakable premises of God's love, grace, and calling from those, not for them. And how, is, how true is this? When we submit to God's sovereign will and his goodness, we pray from a different heart. We're not wondering about our prayers 
We're not wondering if they make it through the ceiling or if they'll be answered. We pray in confidence, see, asking, seeking, and knocking with a sense of expectation and humility. And so we pray in submission. We pray knowing God is good. And then we pray believing God answers our prayers. Jesus tells us to ask and to seek and to knock, and it's going to be open. And, and even in, in John chapter 14, on, on the last night of his life, he's having dinner with the disciples, the Passover meal, the Last Supper. And he says this in John 14, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And now out of context, we may hear that or read that and go, wait a minute, anything? Does that mean if I pray with the right words and the right tone and the right heart and I rub the genie's bottle just the right way, poof, Jesus appears and I get three wishes. Like, like if I pray, Lord, give me hair in the name of Jesus, I've said it in your name, on the way home, I better buy a, a, a comb and some shampoo. No, I've tried it, all right? True story. No, we first have to be sure we're submitting to God's sovereign rule in our lives. And then, as James 4, 3 says, that we're asking with the right motives. And so we submit to God knowing he's good and he answers our prayers, even if we don't like the answer. We pray in faith, believing God will answer. It's theologian, um, Charles Spurgeon said, any, un any uneducated man can knock if that is all which is required of him. A man can knock, though he may be no philosopher. A dumb man can knock. A blind man can knock. With a palsied hand, a man may knock. The way to open heaven's gate is wonderfully simplified to those who are lowly enough to follow the Holy Spirit's guidance and ask, seek, and knock believingly. God has not provided a salvation which can only be understood by learned men. It is intended for the ignorant, the short-witted, and the dying, as well as for others. And hence, it must be as plain as knocking at the door. Now, it, we can knock. But if we knock without believing, we're simply wearing out our knuckles. See, we pray in submission. These are the foundations. We pray in submission. We pray knowing God is good. And we pray believing God answers our prayers. And, and so we might start to get this. And, and Jesus says, when you pray, like in the life of the disciple, it's assumed in this invitation that we will be people of prayer. And we go, well, what, what, what kind of prayer should we pray? Like, how do we know? It, 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 without talking about that, it'd be like sending a pitcher out on the mound and not telling them there are different pitches for different circumstances. And, and so let me give us some, some prayers that, that I think are effective for us. And I'm gonna start with one that won't be up here because I, I, I wrote this message and then this morning as I was reviewing it in my head and, and praying through it, I thought I missed a major piece of prayer. The first prayer that we'll talk about that we won't see up here is confession. A prayer of confession is where we come before, before a holy, righteous God, and we say, God, I have broken your law, I have broken your commandments, I have walked away from you willingly, and there are things in my life that I need to confess to you, and we need to come clean in those areas. As uh, 1 John uh, 1, 9 tells us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. There's these things that we like to hide, this sin that we commit, and we go, man, I hope no one finds out about that. I really hope God doesn't find out about it. And God says, I saw that, but not like in a creepy way. Thankfully, he says, I saw that, and it destroyed me. But I love you enough that, by the way, my son's already paid for that. And yet we hide it, don't we? And we pretend it away, and we hope we don't get caught, but Numbers 32, 23 says our sin will find us out. So it always happens. We need to be people that confess, that come before a holy, righteous God, and we don't pretend like we have it all together, but we're honest about where we don't. And we say, Lord, I, I, I've got anger. I've got lust. Lord, I lost it on that person. Jesus, I, I haven't been honest with my search history, with my finances. There's, I've got these judgmental thoughts, maybe even racist thoughts. Will you forgive me of those? The second kind of prayer is adoration and thanks. And sometimes it's all we can do to sit in the presence of God and praise him. This is where we sit in his presence and we look and we say, God, you were so good that I woke up today. God, you were so good that the sun is shining. It's really hard to, to be frustrated at the things of this world when we're looking at Jesus, just praising him for everything and anything. Jesus, I, I'm thankful for my community group. And, and Jesus, I'm thankful for that, that person that tests my patience every time we gather because I'm learning greater grace and if immediately you go, we don't have anyone like that in our group. You're it, all right? That's you. And everyone else is thankful for you. Where we go, Lord, thank you for the health that I have right now because I haven't always enjoyed that. 
Jesus, thank you for these moments that draw me closer to you. And we just spend time praising him. And it's crazy. As we spend time praising God, we start to see his presence more and more in our lives. It's like when you bought that Honda Accord, and now you see Honda Accords everywhere on the road. You suddenly become aware of them. It's the same thing as we praise God. We start to see his blessings in our lives. And then the third kind of prayers is prayers of request. And this is where we say, hey, what are those places you're stuck? Where do you want to see his presence? What are those places of growth that you want to see in you? What do you want to see in your world today? And so we ask these bold things of God and say, God, will you work out your sovereign plan in our lives right now? Will you move in our community Lord, would you move in Fernley and Fallon as we think about launching that, as we not think about, as we launch that campus later this year? Lord, will you move in my family and all these things that we bring before him that we can't take care of on our own because we're incapable when we say, God, would you step in? And then the third kind, or prayers of intercession, or fourth rather. Intercession is where we go before the Lord on behalf of others. This is where you come before a holy, righteous God. See, God, I, I got this buddy, and he's got cancer. Will you move in his life? Lord, I, I got this friend, and, and his, the valve in his heart isn't working. Will you, will you take care of him? That was a prayer I prayed before our last service for a guy in our lobby. Lord, I, I, I know they're struggling financially. Will you draw them into your presence and provide? Th- this is why we have our one more boards, by the way. And out of all the prayers that we could pray, These prayers of intercession are by far the most loving prayers we can pray because we're going before the Lord, the creator, the eternal one on behalf of them. And I want to remind us too, Jesus tells us to pray for our enemies. Oh, don't go there, Brian. Those that have a different background than you, maybe a different accent, maybe they vote differently than you, we're called to pray for them. Why? Because it's the most loving thing we can do. Prayers of intercession. And then finally, the type of prayer is where we hear from God, where we're hearing from God. And I love those, these moments where I'm crying out to the Lord and he shows up. Where I'm crying out and I'm able to quiet my heart, quiet my mind, quiet my soul and say, Jesus, can I just receive from you? And, and, and this is kind of prayer where we go, I don't know, when I have my quiet time, like I got earbuds in and I'm listening to this stuff and my news feed is going and then the kids are screaming in the background. It's so weird that I don't hear from the Lord. In, in our harried pace, in a rush of life, when we get one, one verse on our phone and we read that and go, okay, Lord, I'm ready for my day. And, and he's going, no, I, I had more in store for you. In my community group, we're talking about how Jesus prepares a table for us and he's invited us to sit at the table, but instead we come by and we go, leftovers, thanks. Right? But, but we need to take time and slow down and be intentional in sitting in his presence. Our soul is like a deer in the forest and wants to come into a clearing. But if you just run into that clearing and say, here I am, man, our souls are gonna bolt. They need time to be still and to be safe and create an environment of stillness. And you go, but Brian, I, I, I just can't do that. I know, I struggle at it too, but I know we need it. And, and so in, in my life, I, I, I set time, I, I get up at five, um, that's a.m. for some of you, you didn't know that existed, but it does. <laughs> Is that like a continuation of the previous day? No, no. So I get up at 5 a.m., 5 a.m. Uh, before the family is up and I, I spend time with the Lord and and sit quietly in his presence. Do, do I always engage with him to the depth I'd like? No. My mind's always racing. and it's hard to slow down. But when God shows up, or I allow myself time for, to see his presence, rather, and it's incredible. And, and so we pray these, these prayers of confession and, and adoration and thanks and, and, and prayers of request and intercession and these prayers where, hey, Lord, I want to hear from you. And, and then you go, but, but how often should I pray? Well, I like in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says this, rejoice always. Some of us should hear that again, rejoice always, right? Like there's this idea, it's hard to be the church curmudgeon. It's hard to be the angry person in the office when you're rejoicing. And so rejoice always, even online, even in an election year, oh boy. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. There's our answer, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We're to pray without ceasing. And so in our cars, at the gym, in the movie, in that fight with the spouse, when when we're walking the dog, when, when we're sick, when we're feeling greater than great and lower than low, wherever we find ourselves, we're to rejoice and give thanks in all those circumstances because God's sovereign will is being lived out and we get to enter into his presence in prayer. And so here's what I desire for us as a church. 
Man, I want us in this, in this multiplied journey, we've said, hey, we want God's presence multiplied in us and through us. You go, what's a multiplied journey? You can find out on our website where, where we're headed as a church. But we want God's presence multiplied in us and through us, and this includes our prayer life. So this is a call for us to pray and to lean into prayer like never before and to hear from God and to spend time in his presence. And again, you go, but, but Brian, I, I'm just not sure it's gonna work. Let, let me share some more things here to, to strengthen our prayer life. When you enter into God's presence in prayer, be honest with him. Show up and say, God, I feel foolish. I feel like I've got the training wheels and the banana seat and the handlebars and the basket and the bing, 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 and everyone else is on like, like, a speed bike going by, and I just don't know what I'm doing. Be honest with them, because you go, we can work with that. It's not about how you pray. It's about our heart's position in that. And so we show up, and we're honest with the Lord of God. I haven't done this. God, it feels weird. God, I'm kind of mad at you because of something in the past that I prayed about, and you didn't answer. Then we believe that God can move the mountain in front of us. And so with the faith of a mustard seed, you look at that thing that is big and scary and overwhelming. And you say, God, I believe you can move in that. And so I'm going to be honest with you in this. And I'm going to believe that you're going to do something about it. And then we ask God to reveal the bigger picture, his sovereign will. And we go, God, I don't understand what you're doing in my world or my life. But I know that you are good. And so I'll hang on to that truth and admit that I don't get it all. And in the midst of this, will you move that thing while I hang on to you? And maybe you need to borrow someone else's faith. This is where community matters. There, there are times in my life, and I've talked about this, where it's all I can do to hang on to your coattails and your faith as you drag me along in all the right ways. Because there are times when I go, I don't know about this thing. I don't know how that's going to work out. And, and there are folks that come up, oh man, this is so great. God's going to do this. I'm like, I will hang on to you because I need you. Because I need your faith. And, and maybe then you start to look back at God's faithfulness. You know, in the moment, it's hard to see where God is working. But as we look in the rearview mirror and those moments where we wondered in the past if he was working and then we're removed from that situation, we go, oh my gosh, God, you were right there. And he goes, yeah, I told you I wouldn't leave you or forsake you. But I didn't see it. I know. And I put up with you anyways. And he's doing that right now as well. And then we start to pray with someone else. We start to pray with others. I, I love that our, our uh, staff loves to pray. We gather on Saturdays before service to pray. We gather on Sunday mornings to pray. It's an open invite, by the way, 8 a.m. We gather, uh, I gather with a group of men now on, on Sundays at 7 a.m. to pray. And we just pray with others. And there are times in my life where I have to send someone a text and say, hey, can you pray for me because I'm struggling with this thing? And they, they go, yeah, and I'll check in on you. And so maybe that needs to happen, right? And I, I remember uh, the power that we get to pray with. In Ephesians 1, Paul talks about this, that the same power that raised Jesus from the grave is accessible for us today. That's an incredible promise. And oftentimes there's this invitation to enter into God's presence, but we forget about the power that comes with that. And so here is my challenge for us to become people of prayer, to allow God's presence to be multiplied in us and then through us as we pray. And so what we're gonna do right now is that the worship team is here, we're gonna worship. We're gonna stand in the presence of a holy, righteous God and praise his name and offer prayer. And so we're gonna have our prayer counselors over here. And you go, maybe you just need to, uh, rejoice with someone. Maybe you just need to come with tears and, and not say anything, and they're going to understand. Maybe you need to come and say, hey, I, I don't understand this Jesus you've been talking about, and we've been singing about. Can I give my life to him? Can I make him my Lord? They'll pray with you. Maybe it's the divorce or the separation or the diagnosis or the fear over the wayward child. I don't know what it is. But in these moments, I would encourage you to come and receive prayer. Would you stand with us as we worship?